Glad you're here today. We're going to move ahead in our study. We're in the book of Galatians, and I'm going to move ahead about a chapter. It's not that the other, the, that the chapter we're going to jump over today is not important. It's very important. But I want to move ahead into Galatians chapter 5. I want to begin in verse 13 today. And I want to read through verse 25. The title of this morning's message is entitled, An Inside Job. An Inside Job. Paul is writing this letter, just to, uh, just to refresh your memory, Paul is writing this letter to a Gentile church. Galatia was a Gentile church. And uh, the Judaizers were coming back uh, uh, trying to cause all of these Gentile believers to fall back under the law. And Paul says, you know, I, I, I'm just astonished at how quickly, you, uh, how quickly you, you have been removed from him from Christ into a system. He says, I can't believe it. I'm just, I'm shocked. Because these Judaizers were saying, yeah, we'll give you Jesus, we'll give you that. Yeah, it's Jesus, but it's Jesus in this. And Paul says, he says, look, you were slaves. You were bond and bond slaves. You were under the law. He said, but when Christ set you free, he says, you were free. Why do you want to go back into bondage? Why do you want to do that? And so he's, he's, he's talking to these Galatians that are getting caught up in legalism. He addresses all the freedoms that they have in Christ. And now he's challenging those who are slipping back into and under the law of legalism. They were, he told them, he says, look, you're free from the law. You're, you're free from guilt. You're, you're free from the penalty of sin. And you're free from the power of sin. And I'm sure there have been many of them. Many of them would ask this question. Maybe some of you here ask this question. If I'm free from all this, if I'm free, really free, Paul, why do I struggle? Why do I still battle? Why is there this war that seems to rage with inside of me? Am I the only one? Maybe you're here today that says, am I the only one that struggles with this? I need to keep it a secret. I come in here to this church and I look around and certainly... The people in this building are not struggling, are not dealing with the same thing that I'm dealing with. Certainly not. And Paul understands that. Paul understands that very clearly. He understands the power uh, of the flesh, of the, the carnal mind. And he understands the war that takes place within inside a believer. Because he had battles in his own life. He understands it. And so now he's addressing this, and in chapter 5, in verse 13 to 15, um, let's go ahead and read down, let's, let's just kind of read as we go. Paul says here in verse 13 to 15, he says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Look at that. You have been called to liberty, to freedom. Only use not liberty as a, or for an occasion... For the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed. Take heed that you be not consumed one of another. So, so legalism, and just looking at those verses, legalism obviously didn't produce much fruit here. <laughs> Legalism is not a fruit producer. Not a good fruit producer. And I think this is kind of this letter here, you could, you could as Paul writes this, at least what he's talking about here in this, this chapter, we can kind of relate that to the Corinthian church because he, he, he tells them, he says, hey man, you're biting, you're devouring each other. The Corinthian church was doing that. And how... how Listen, how do, how, do, how do Christians do that? Do Christians bite and devour one another? Oh, yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. But Paul says here in these verses, he says, he says look, he says, you've been called to liberty. You've been called. God called you. I didn't call you. God called you to liberty, to freedom. And he says, and don't use the liberty that you have as, a, as a, uh, a license to sin. Don't do that. And, you know, we preach grace. And you have these, these churches who preach grace. 
And it is grace. You're saved by grace through faith. God's unmerited favor. God doing for you and I what you and I could never, ever do for ourselves. We preach grace. But there are those that say, that's cheap grace. You preach grace, and that gives Christians a license to sin. Let me tell you, I I don't believe that. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit of God is not going to let you get away with that. And if there is no conviction in your life, then you really need to do some heart searching whether or not you're really truly born again. God's Spirit won't let you do that. And there are those that say it's cheap grace. Well, there's no such thing as cheap grace. (laughs) Grace came at the expense of God's only Son, the blood of Christ. It's not cheap. It comes at a high price. But those that preach... uh, you know, cheap grace, and, and those that believe it say, you know what, I can do this, I can do that, and I'll repent tomorrow, and I'll, and I'll be all right, or, or I'll go to church here and go to church there, and I'll go to confessional here and get rid of that. No such thing as cheap grace, folks. So Paul says here, don't use the liberty. You've been called the liberty. He says here, and he uses a military term, he says, only use not liberty for an occasion occasion. Some some will term that license. It's a military term. And here's what it means. The base of operation. The base of operation. He says, don't use the liberties that you have in Christ. And he's speaking to us too. Don't use the liberties that you have in Jesus Christ as a base of operation to commit sin. Don't do it. Don't do it. But he says here in verse 14, he says, for the law, the law Uh, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So he tells us in verse 14 that we're to serve one another. You and I are to serve one another. We're to serve one another in love. Don't use the liberties, the freedoms you have in Christ as a base of operation to continue to sin, but use the, the liberties that we have in Christ as a base of operation to love one another and to serve one another. He says, verse 15, because if you bite and devour one another, you just might be consumed by one another. An interesting interesting thought. How many of you are free in Christ today? How many of you believe that? You've been set free from the power of sin. And so the liberties that we have, we we are to use that as a base of operation to serve and to love one another. Listen, I need help with that. I need help with that. So if if we're not to use it as a base of operation for the flesh to sin, what do we do? And and I think I think he I think he he allows elaborates here a little more. Look at verse 16. He says, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now I think that's important. It's important for you and I to see this verse forward, just the way that Paul has written it out. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Remember, he was writing to a Gentile church, young in their faith, being lulled back into legalism by Judaism, by Judaizers, lulled back into it. Legalists, legalism. And so it's easy, it's important for us to see this verse forward. Because the first, the first thing a legalist says, the first thing I believe a legalist would say is this here. Well, if I don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh, if I don't, if I don't do this or I don't do that, or, or if I do this and I do this and I do this and I behave this way and I do this, well then, well then I'm walking in the Spirit. That's not what the verse says. The verse doesn't say that. The verse says, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. And then you shall fulfill, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's the order. But a true legalist will turn that around. And we do that too. Well, if I don't do this, I don't do that, then I'm walking in the Spirit. No, that's not true. No, that's not true. We are born in the Spirit. God has given us gifts by the Spirit. And you and I are to walk in the Spirit according to the Spirit. And these Galatians, I'm sure that these Galatians would say, you know, if I'm truly free from all this stuff, why do I battle? Why do I struggle? Why? 
Why is there, why is there this traitor, as it were, this traitor inside of me? Why? I want you to know this this morning. This is the experience of every believer who has ever lived. This is the experience. What we're about to read is the experience of every believer who has ever lived. We have a battle that wars inside of us. We have this fight that goes on in there. Look, and don't be deceived by this. Don't be deceived. And I don't want to water this down either, but I want, I want this, this is, there's truth in this. Sometimes we feel that like we're dealing with something in our life, or we're battling with the flesh, and there's something that's wrong in our life, there's sin in our camp, and we say, you know, I almost got this licked. If only I had an altar call and a half. You know, I almost got it, man, I almost got it licked. If only I had, maybe the pastor could just give me another 15 minutes, I get another half an altar call in there. Mm-mm. If I only had another commitment, if I only had one more recommitment, if I only had one more baptism, if I only had one more membership do-over, you know, I'd get it right. I think, I think you and I kid ourselves and say, why am I still struggling? <laughs> why am I still struggling? If all this power, if all this power, Pastor Jeff, you say every week, not every week, but you say from the pulpit here that Jeremy Camp's song says that the same power that raised Jesus from the grave lives in me. If all this is true, if this really is true, the Holy Spirit of God and all this power lives in me and is effective in my life, why am I struggling? See, I think that's deceiving ourselves from the get-go. We are not still struggling. Here, let me give you a word of encouragement. We are not still struggling. We've just begun to struggle. What do you mean? Well, before Christ, you didn't struggle. You didn't battle like this. And when you got saved, the battle began. The battle began. You didn't struggle before you got saved. The struggle is evidence that you are born again. You know, Charles Spurgeon wrote this. He says, dead men don't struggle. Dead men, actually he said, dead men don't wrestle. Get that? Dead men don't wrestle. I'm not dead, I'm alive. <laughs> and I'm alive through Christ. And guess what? I battle. I battle. We wrestle because the new nature, the new nature is now dominating our heart and our mind, our thinking and our life. The flesh is no longer in control. There's a new sheriff in town. The flesh. Before we, before we got saved, the flesh controlled our lives. The old man, the old nature controlled everything we did. And I'm not, when I say flesh, I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about meat, this meat. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fleshly nature. I'm talking about desires that are from our, our fleshly appetite. It has nothing to do with this physical frame. You, you listen, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, or I, I need to tell you this, Christianity, listen, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. It, it, it's, it's not a, it's not, Christianity is not following a bunch of rules. Get up, sit down, get up, sit down, turn around, put your foot in, put your foot out, put your money in, pick your money out. That's not Christianity. Christianity is a relationship. And the problem with these Galatians is this. They thought Christianity was a relationship. Or a, 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 a religion. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. The flesh is no longer in control. And before you got saved, you were dominated by the flesh. That's all there was. Before you gave your life to Christ, you were dominated by the flesh. We were self-centered in the flesh. Our lives were dictated by the flesh. Everything we did was in the flesh. He, tells, he told us in verse 14, look what he says there. He tells us not to be self-centered. We just read it. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's not self-centered. That's looking out. Be others-centered. And listen, I believe if you don't grasp this battle and understand why it exists, then there's danger for you and I to fall into legalism. If we don't understand this battle, 
<clears throat> we're going to talk about it here again. If you don't understand this battle, you don't grasp why it exists, you and I, there's a danger for us to fall into legalism. You know why? Because this bat- we say this battle is still going on. I've still got this battle. I love Jesus, and this battle is still going on. So you know what I've got to do? I've got to try harder. I've got to do more. And I've got to keep this rule. And I've got to keep this rule. And I've got to do this. And I've got to strive in my flesh to achieve these things. And you know what happens? First of all, you can't do it. But we get this sense of gratification. We say, oh, if I do this and I do this, now I get a 90% of my report card instead of a 70. So now I get a B instead of a D. And we live on scales now. We, we've added scales to the mix. And what happened, the problem with this is we start to feel better about ourselves. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I'm doing better. I'm keeping this and, and I'm keeping that. Glad I don't do that anymore. Ha! Can't believe she still does that. This is what we do. This is who we become. And you know what? That appeals to the flesh. That appeals to the fleshly nature. That appeals to the old man inside of us. And I want you to know something. I believe that this never produces the character of Christ in us. It doesn't. Do you know what it does? It just makes us try to keep rules. And then what happens is we get bitter, we get burned out, we're stressed out, because we're doing it in our own energy. we got to understand <clears throat> that normally when we sin, when there's things going on that are not right in our lives, when we sin, we need to understand that it's born from something inside of us inside of us. James says this, let no man say that when he is tempted, he is tempted of God. Now, temptation is not sin. Let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God, for God tempteth no man. But every man, when he is drawn away, is tempted when he is drawn away after his what? His own, that's right, his own lust, his own desire, and enticed. And then, and then what happens, it leads to LSD. Lust leads to sin, and sin leads to death. So we've got to understand that when we sin, when we do something wrong, when, there, when there's sin in our camp and there's sin in our life, it, it normally is born from something inside of us. Look at verse 17. <clears throat> he says here, For the flesh... Lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, I want to read that one more time, because I feel like, and I told my Roman study, when Paul talked about this in Romans 7, which we're going to read here in a minute, I feel like I wrote this. He says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit lusteth against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, the one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. The flesh lusteth against the spirit. What is that? The flesh lusteth. Lusteth against the spirit. The flesh desires to hold down or suppress the influence of the spirit living inside of you. That's what the flesh desires to do. Hold down or suppress the spirit. And vice versa. It says here, the second part of verse 17, and the, spirit, and the spirit lusteth against the flesh. Lusteth is not a bad word. In the Greek, it just means desires. The, the, the spirit desires to hold down or to suppress the flesh. And so you have this back and forth battle. And listen, you're not schizophrenic. But it uses a word here that's pretty important in verse 17. It says, it says, and they and these, the spirit and the flesh, these are contrary one to another. Weiss, who graduated from Moody, was a Moody Bible Institute, he said this in his commentary. He said this, is the word contrary. He says, the spirit and the flesh, they are entrenched against each other. Do you understand? They are entrenched. 
militarily. They are dug in, man. The, 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 the flesh is dug in. He's, he's dug in against the spirit, and the spirit is dug in against the flesh. And listen, there's no compromise between the two. There's no compromise. None. They're dug in against each other. They're not going to give ground against each other. It's kind of like the guy in the cartoon. <clears throat> the guy in the cartoon who, who says, uh, oh, Jesus, oh, I just want to slug this guy. And he gets this little devil appears on his shoulder. Bing! Go ahead, man. He deserves it. Slug him. And this little angel comes on the other side. Bing! No, don't do it. No, don't hit him. Please don't hit him. We don't deserve that. And this little devil says, oh, don't listen to him. He plays a harp. Do you want to be a man or do you want to be a sissy? Hit him. Slug him. And this, and this little angel says, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do it. Hell's hot or whatever. You know, so there's, this, there's this battle that goes on that wages this war. <clears throat> and these two are contrary to one another. They're entrenched against one another. Dug in against each, each other. Not giving, not giving way to each other. And, and Paul, I want to show you Paul's example. Keep your finger there. And, and let's look at, look at Paul's life back in Romans chapter 7. He gives us a picture of this. And you know, I think this is interesting because it's very easy for you and I to see, see this in the life of somebody else, even maybe even more so than our own life. But Paul brings this out very clearly in his own life, and it's easy for us to see. Look at Romans chapter 7, and look at verse 18 to 24. <clears throat> he says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not do, but the evil which I would not, that's what I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find that a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's the battle. We read it in six verses in Paul's life, but Paul battled it too. Listen, you're here this morning. You have the same struggles. You have the same battle. You have the flesh. I have the flesh. Billy Graham has the flesh. Charles Spurgeon had the flesh. Everybody has the flesh. But this war, this battle, this, this entrenched stance doesn't occur until after you're saved. Until you, after you have the new man, the new nature living inside of you. Once you're saved, they're both there. They're inside of you. They're inside of me. And you know what? Sometimes we do this. We try to blame it on somebody else. <laughs> we, 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 we try to blame it. On, on others, we say, well, we start, we start saying, well, it's the spirits. It's the, uh, it's the spirit of lust. It's the spirit of drugs. It's the spirit of alcohol. It's the, we'll do what Adam did. It's the woman you gave me. Or it's the man you gave me. Pa Paul's going to give us a list here. Paul's going to give us a list, and we're going to read it back in Galatians. And, it, and it's not demons. <laughs> They're not spirits. It's the flesh. Makes it very clear. And you know what? And we do this sometimes. We blame it on advertising. Well, we, I have this advertisement in front of me all the time. You know, the TV shows this kind of garbage. I drive up and down. I got this, these two billboards on my way to work that show this stuff all the time. It's very clear to me. You know, it's the commercials and stuff. No, it's not. It's the flesh. It's the flesh. It's there, and it's inside of you. Now, it's not Satan. It's not the devil. Satan is the God of this world. He doesn't possess you. He doesn't live inside of you. Satan is the God of this world, and he appeals to the flesh. All that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And Satan appeals to that. But it's not the devil inside you. It's the flesh. It's the flesh. 
And the flesh used to dominate us. <laughs> now the power of it has been broken through the blood of Christ, through Calvary's cross, and through the person of the Holy Spirit. But this, there is a battle there now, and it will be there. There's a report I was telling Stacy here a couple nights ago. There's a report by these doctors, this, the, these doctors reading it online, there's a report by these doctors that said that children or infants, infants, this is interesting, I didn't know this, at four weeks old, learn how to manipulate Four weeks old? They know how to manipulate? They cry to get picked up. They cry to get changed. They cry to get their bottle. They don't have any mercy because they could care less if you sleep or not. They don't care if formula is part of your budget. And they don't spare the huggies. It's the flesh. They want what they want when they want it. And he says they're very self-centered. The first words that come out of their mouth are me, 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 me. I, 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 I. And we wonder where we get it from, right? They're self-centered. But there's a battle now, and it will be there. And we say, well, 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 when will this end? When is this battle going to end? Will it ever end? Well, it will. Look at, keep your finger there and look at 1 Corinthians. Look at chapter 15. Here's when it'll end. 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 53 and verse 54. He says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. <laughs> and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. There is going to be a struggle when until you and I die. Chuck Swindoll, in one of his books he wrote, did an interview with an 83-year-old missionary who came off the mission field because of health reasons. He wasn't able to minister <coughs> overseas anymore in big, dark, dark areas. So Chuck Swindoll interviewed this guy, and here's what he asked him, one, one of the questions he asked him. He says, when did you, learn to, when did you, when did you finally kick the, 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 the lust struggle? He says, I, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. 83 years old. 83 years old. And John, keep your finger in Galatians and turn back to 1 John. Look what John says here in John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, and look at verse 8. And I love this. John, John says this, If we say that we have no sin, singular, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Here's John at 90 years old, an apostle of God, uses the personal pronoun we. John struggled in the flesh. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. John includes himself. John battled in the flesh too. And he uses the singular the thing, he, doesn't, he doesn't say sins, plural. He says sin, which is sin problem. The problem of sin. So Paul says, here's what's going on in your life. You got this spirit. It's entrenched against the flesh. You got the flesh. He's entrenched against the spirit. And they, they are in, entrenched and dug in against each other. And there's no compromise between them. In verse, the second part of verse 17, we read it. It says this, and these are contrary the one to another, say you cannot do the things that you would. Verse 17 says that their influence is so strong that you can't even do the things that you would. Folks, you don't have a third choice. You don't have a third choice. I don't have a third choice. A God's child either yields to the flesh or yields to the spirit. Yields to the flesh or yields to the Spirit. Listen, and, 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 and you've heard, I've heard this for years with Jim preaching here, prior to me coming on board here, is this. Don't negotiate with the flesh. Don't try to rehab it. Don't negotiate with it. Have you ever given your dog one dog biscuit? That was it? <laughs> Come on. Or set your dog up to the table to eat. Some of you do that. Set your dog up to the table and eat and give him, and give, give him half a steak. Say, look, I'm just going to give you one steak. Okay, and he got slobbers all over the place. He wants more. I think it's a good picture of the flesh. Don't try to negotiate with the, with the flesh. Don't try to rehab it. Verse 24 tells us this in Galatians chapter 5. And they that are Christ 
have crucified the flesh and the affections and lust. Just consider it dead. The Bible says, don't rehab it. Consider it dead. Always consider it dead. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 that, that we are to reckon it dead. Consider it dead. It's interesting when we think about this. I forget who said this, but he says this. He said, Christ died for us to remove, Christ died for us to remove the penalty of sin. Would you agree? Christ died to remove the penalty of sin. But you and I die to Christ to conquer the influence of sin. You and I die to Christ. You and I die to Christ to conquer the influence of sin. Jesus says, if any man desire to come after me, let him first deny himself. Deny himself. Take up his cross. And then follow me. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, if you're taking notes or you write these down, Colossians 3, 3 says this, in light of this. It says, for we are dead and your life is hid with Christ Jesus. Listen, folks, you can never satisfy the flesh. Never satisfy it. Don't, excuse me, don't try to negotiate with it. Consider it dead because you can never satisfy it. And you and I know this. You and I know we can't satisfy the flesh. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. When we go to a restaurant, and you eat so much, and you go to those big smorgasbords, those big all-you-can-eat feast places, and listen, I've done it. Trust me, I've done it. It looks like I still do it, I know. But it looks like you've done it. And you go there, and you commit the sin of gluttony. <laughs> and your shirt and your buttons look like that. you got them stretched all the way out there. And you're physically, in your physical frame, you're feeling it. You're feeling the frame. You're, 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 guys, listen. L- listen, I've done it. You've loosened your belt under the table where nobody knows. Oh, my gosh. Psh, to give you a little bit of breathing room. You're wishing that or you can't wait till you get home to put your sweatsuit on so you can feel comfortable. Okay? And so in the flesh, you feel miserable. And then the dessert menu comes. And you think, if I eat two more bites, I'm going to explode in the physical frame. But the flesh and nature is like, oh, man, that looks so good. Oh, that looks so good. But I can't eat. I'm going to explode. I'm going to split. Oh, but that dessert looks so good. Oh, what's life? I'll split it with you. But that's the flesh. You can't satisfy it. It craves and it desires more and more and more. And what's not satisfied is the fleshly nature. The physical frame is about to burst. But the flesh says, hey, let's get some more. And you're ready to split. Well, Paul tells us here, look at verse 18 and verse 19. He says, but if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. <laughs> If you're led by the Spirit, not under the law. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest. They're evident. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Look down at verse 20. I'll read to the end of them. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, and revelings. We struggle in the flesh. The struggle is this. The spirit and the flesh are enemies one to another. And and I believe he gives us a parameter. Sometimes we'll say this. Well, how do I know it's, it's really me, my own desire? How do I know it's the flesh? How do I know it's the spirit of God? And I, and I believe that's a struggle we all have sometimes, but he gives us some parameters here. Listen, he says this is the flesh. <laughs> here's what the flesh produces. So, so here's some parameters. Here's how you can eliminate the flesh. If you're like, is this is the flesh, this is my own desire, or is this, is, this, uh, is, is this the spirit? Well, you can eliminate the flesh by looking at these things, because Paul tells us exactly what they are. He says they're evident. This is the flesh. This is what it produces. He says it manifests. It's evident. Look what he says. Adultery. If you're in adultery... If you're committing the act of adultery, it's in the flesh. It's not a mystery. 
It's in the flesh. Paul says it's evident. It's manifest. It's evident. It's made known. If you're committing adultery, it's in the flesh. Well, he said, I don't have sexual sin. The Bible says if you've, if you've lusted after a woman. Men? If you've lusted after a woman, women, if you've lusted after a man, you've committed adultery with them in your heart already. That's in the flesh. That's not the spirit. (laughs) That's in the flesh. Look at fornication. Second one, fornication. Different forms of sexual sin. Different forms. Homosexuality, fornication, any type of sexual sin, sex outside the marriage. If you're involved, you're in the flesh. Not the spirit. Uncleanness, lasciviousness. The idea is wantonness, always wanting more. Look what he says, idolatry. And when we preach about this, we talk about this. Idolatry, anything, anything, placing anything above Jesus Christ. Now, we're all guilty of adultery. Because we've done this. Placing anything above Christ. Career. Money. Not to step on any toes. Golf. Fishing. Children. Anything. If you put anything above Jesus Christ, it has become your God, you're worshiping it. It is not of the Spirit, it is of the flesh. Look what he says. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. I'm not involved in witchcraft. Why is that in there for me? Well, that's our word. Get this. This is our word pharmakia. Pharmakia. Pharmakia is where we get our English word pharmacy. Pharmacy. So listen. One of the greatest ways that Satan is going to get you and I to fall into witchcraft is, 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 not, is, is not, not to have us design a pentagram on our living room floor and sacrifice chickens in our living room. That's not what's going to happen. The way that he sucks us into witchcraft is through the use of drugs. Pharmacia, pharmacy, pharmaceuticals, pharmacy, drugs, potions, um, poisons. When we're involved in those things, when we're using those things, we're opening ourselves up to realms that God never intended us to be involved in. And the Bible says they're not of the spirit, they're of the flesh. They're of the flesh. Hatred. Look here, now he's changing. He's changing a little bit. He goes, he goes from adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. Then he goes to hatred and variance and strife. Uh, ha- hatred, hatred, variance, emulations. He, he goes to things that are relational. Look at it. He, he like, these are like in categories. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, things that you can look up and, 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 and define in your own time. But he's saying these things are not of the Spirit of God. They're of the flesh. Envyings, murders, verse 21. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. Revelings are really the result of drunkenness. When you're hung over, the ne- the, 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 you're drunk, and the next day you wake up, you remember what happened, what, what took place, if you can remember. Those are revelings. These are things the church, Paul says, shouldn't be involved in. They're, they're not in the spirit. They're in the flesh. And look, I know people, I know people, and I don't want, I'm going to be careful. I know people who love to gossip. Look, there's like, hey, did you hear? They go, they got drool coming down their chin. Did you hear? So they love to gossip more than they love lobster and steak. They just can't wait. These are not of the spirit. These are not spirits. These are not demons. They are the flesh. They are of the old nature. And, and he says here, he says, envyings, verse 21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Such like. And he's saying that brings in everything else that you do that I didn't mention. 
Everything else that's out there that you do that I didn't mention. But look here, verse 21. Envies, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past. I don't want to clear this up. That they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh Uh-oh. Those people who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So So you and I are going down through this list. Okay, adultery, I'm safe. Fornication, I'm good. Uncleanness and stuff is uh, not really. I- idolatry. I-, I love Jesus. I love Him above everything. Um, witchcraft. No, I'm not using drugs. Um, hatred. Oh man. Variance. Mm, emulations. Wrath. Strife. Seditions. Heresies. Envyings. Oh no. Murder. I haven't killed anybody. Drunkenness. Oh jeez. Revelings. Oh no. I'm not going to heaven. Oh no. I'm not going. I'm not going to glory. I'm doomed. Paul says, if you do. The word do, here's what he's saying. If you habitually practice this lifestyle, it's not an act. It's not someone who who has, has used drugs for 10 years of their life, been clean for five, give their heart to Jesus Christ, and two years later they fell back in and they repented of their sin. It's not talking about that. He's talking about someone who who their lifestyle is this. They live this their whole life. Habitually practice, not an act. What is he saying? If you habitually practice these things in your life, there has been no new birth that has taken place in you. And you're not on your way to heaven. That's what he says. Let's just cut through the chase. That's what he says. Don't tell me that you love Jesus and then you go out and you continually get hammered. Don't tell me you love Jesus. I love Jesus. I'm going out and getting hammered every night, every weekend, hungover, neglecting my family, or I'm using drugs. Or I'm caught in, I love Jesus, but I'm living in adultery, man. I'm just, I'm living a high life. Paul says, for those who'd live a lifestyle like this, he says, there's been no change. Do you know why he can say that? Because the Spirit of God, because the Spirit will not let you get away with this. You have to believe that. How many of you have done something in your life, have committed a sin, Christians have done something wrong, and the Holy Spirit has bugged the crap out of you? Yeah! Now, how many of you have done something and, and are continually right now living in something and you're not bugged at all? Don't raise your hand. You need to look and check and see, make sure everything's in the up and up. But don't tell me you love Christ and then go out and continually get hammered. Your Bible says you were not intended to the, the, the kingdom of God. Don't tell me you use drugs and, and, and continually go out and use drugs. The Bible says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Look, put that in your pipe and smoke it. If the shoe fits, wear it. I don't have to worry about it because I don't do it. If you're out doing drugs, if you're out getting hammered all the time, don't tell me you love Jesus. You love cocaine. You love heroin. You love ice. You love marijuana. You love this. You love, you love the booze you're drinking. You love the, the hard liquor. You love the canned stuff. You, that's, that's what you love. If, that's, if this is your lifestyle, that's what you love. That's what you love. A habitual lifestyle. It doesn't say a lapse. It doesn't say, a, oops, I sinned. Gosh, God, I'm so sorry. Thank you for the Spirit of God that's convicting me. No, it's not saying that. It's not saying that. You know, the Bible says this in 2 Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy 2.19. I think this is a great verse for you and I as Christians. 2 Timothy 2.19. Here's what he says. Paul writes this. He says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. Here's what it has. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's what we should do. He's talking about a habitual lifestyle. If you practice any of these things habitually, there's no change on the inside of you. If this is you, look, it's not too late for you. 
Because you can repent, you can get you can get saved right here today. Do you know that? You can get saved today. If you're watching by way of the internet, or you're watching by way of the DVD, or listening by way of the CD, you can get saved right now. You can say, this is my life, and I don't want it to be my life. And you can give your heart to Jesus right now. Right now. You can repent, and you can get right with him. And listen, I believe we're close to eternity, so I wouldn't delay. Look at verse 22 and verse 23. He says, but the fruit, look at the, here, here we are, but, here's the butologies of the Bible. But the fruit of the Spirit is, here's, the fruit of the Spirit is, this one theme, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Again, such there is no law. In contrast to everything he's saying, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Listen, when I, when I read that, <clears throat> and I read, I read love, joy, peace, I get a warm, fuzzy feeling. I love that. How many of you love love, joy, and peace? How many of you like that? Yeah. I go, ah. But when I get to the next one, I'm not sure. Long-suffering. Long-suffering. But meekness and long-suffering and, and temperance, anything to do with patience and tolerating, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's interesting because in verse 19, he says this, the first three words. He says, now the works of the flesh, the works, plural. And down in verse 22, he says, but the fruit, not fruits. I've heard people say, these are the fruits of the Spirit. No, they're not fruits. It's fruit, singular. Singular, fruit. Works, plural, fruit, singular. He says fruit is love. Love. Th think about what he just said, love. And, and that's, that's contrasted to what he said in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in verse 13 in terms of, you know, hey, the liberties that you have in Jesus Christ, don't use them as a base of operation for the lust of the flesh. For, for sin, he says, he says, don't be self-centered anymore. He says, the, the, the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, that thou shalt not love thy neighbor as thyself. Fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. This is what the Spirit of God produces in every believer. Love. Listen, when you love, when you're loving your neighbor as yourself, listen, when you love as Christ desires you to love, we, we receive an element of joy and peace out of that. No doubt. Look, the Holy Spirit produces joy and peace in our lives. Produces long-suffering patience. Produces gentleness. Produces goodness. Produces faith, meekness, and temperance. He says, against such there is no law. There's no law that can ever come against that. None. And, and look, when, when I think of works, because Paul's dealing with works, when I think of works, I, I get this picture of this assembly line in this factory, you, you know, working and laboring and toiling. Look, you cannot produce fruit in a factory. You don't produce fruit in an assembly line. You don't produce fruit in, 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 a, in, in a warehouse. You can't do that. It's produced by life. Life. Look what Jesus says in John chapter 15 and verse 5. And you know this verse. But look at John 15 verse 5. He says, I am the vine. And you are the branches. And he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Fruit is produced by life. You and I, by remaining in the vine, Jesus is our life. The Holy Spirit is our life. The fruit that is produced is only produced through His life, the Spirit in us. Legalism does not produce this. The law does not produce this. St only staying and remaining in the vine produces life. Keeping rules and regulations cannot. Remember verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. 
Walk in the Spirit. And here's, here's the fruit that it's going to produce. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Listen, we all struggle. I struggle. You struggle. Billy Graham struggles. You're here today and you're a Christian and you say, Look, I need more patience. I need more love. I need more peace. Look, so do I. So do I. But this verse says fruit. It, 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 this says, says fruit. It, and when, when, you, when you look at this, but the fruit of the Spirit, look, we're, we're talking about seasons of life. When we're talking about fruit. Do apple trees grow in the wintertime here? Do, 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 well, apple trees might grow, but do apples, do fruit, is fruit produced on apple trees in the winter here in Pennsylvania? No, we're talking about seasons. And look, some of the seasons of life, and you're not going to like this, are pruning. There's pruning seasons. The Bible talks about Jesus being a husbandman who cuts off the dead branches. The husbandman. There's an environment involved. Think about it. Apples don't grow here in Pennsylvania in the winter. There's an environment involved. How about an environment of worship? A time of worship, a time where you and I can get alone with God. A good, healthy environment. Just you and God, just me and God alone. No cell phones, no TVs, no, no house phones where you can get alone and find yourself in communication and communion with God on a daily basis. It's about seasons, pruning, a husbandman, an environment, worship, study of the Word of God, fellowship, being in church. There's an environment involved here. He says in verse 24 and 25, he says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. We need to see the flesh as crucified, as dead. And he says in verse 25, And if we live... If we have life in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we have life in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Look, only the the Holy Spirit can produce the character of Christ inside of each and every one of us. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. It's not keeping rules. It's not keeping regulations. This only makes you a miserable legalist. The Holy Spirit produces this in you. Then the keeping of rules and regulations can come out of that. He says, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's a daily struggle for us. It's a battle. It's a war. And these two things, these, the flesh and the Spirit, are entrenched against each other. I've often said this, and I say it again. You have both caged up inside of you. And the one that you feed the most is the one that will dominate your life. Are you feeding the flesh? Because if you are, it wants more. You can't satisfy it. Or are you feeding the spirit of God? It's a battle. It's a war. And it'll end one day when you take your last breath. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, I thank you today for the word of God. I thank you for Paul's challenge to this Galatian church. Recognize, Lord, their need to be to be walking in the spirit and not only them, but us. They had this uh, the great temptation of the Judaizers to come back in and and to suck them back under the law to cause them to, to become legalistic. Lord, help us from that. Our our freedoms, our liberties, we have been called to liberty. And our freedoms and our liberty is found in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And I said this before, if we add anything to grace, it's no longer grace. If we add anything to grace, it is no longer grace. It becomes works. It becomes uh, anything other than unmerited favor. Lord, I know that everybody in this room, I know that everybody in here this morning who is a born-again believer in Christ, anybody who is watching by way of this internet or watching by way of DV or listening by CD, I know if they're born again, truly born again of the Spirit, they struggle. They battle. 
Do I say this? Don't I say this? But Lord, if there's somebody in here this morning who says they're a Christian, who, who says, I gave my life to Christ, maybe they, maybe they really think they did, but Lord, there's no battle warging, waging inside of them. They just, they just, they're habitually living the lifestyle that the flesh produces. Lord, it may be that the Holy Spirit of God is not there today. And Lord, they can repent right now and say, God, help me. I'm a sinner. And I need the life that the Holy Spirit provides. I need born again into your family. God, forgive me. And come live. Holy Spirit, live inside my heart and change me. I pray that for anyone that's here today that doesn't know you. And for us as Christians that battle every day, I pray this, and we were talking about this this week in my pastor's, our pastor's meeting. That Lord... I I believe this is just an analogy that I use to to help keep me on track once in a while. Lord, I need to use you as a filter in my life for everything that I do. Just like a coffee filter. Those old-fashioned coffee filters with these espresso machines. We don't have those, I know. But those old coffee filters. Lord, that resembles you. And Lord, we need to take everything that we do. Lord, is what I'm about to say, is that going to bring honor and glory to you and run it through the filter? Lord, is what I'm about to do, is that going to bring honor and glory to you? Lord, how, how is every part of my life going to bring honor and glory to you and run all that through the filter of God and see what comes out the other end? Lord, if the answer is no to any of that stuff, we, we probably shouldn't do it. Our purpose here in this life is to bring honor to glory to you, to walk in the Spirit so that we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yes, we have a battle. It it rages inside of us every day. Every moment it's there. Can't satisfy the flesh. But Lord, it's there. But Lord, the Spirit of God that lives inside of us, I believe is greater than the old fleshly nature. Help us to feed the Spirit, to live a life pleasing and honoring to you, and lead, guide, and direct our steps, we pray it in Christ's name.